This video was brought to you by my amazing patrons on Patreon. So, like a lot of people, I was very pleasantly surprised by the Shadow and Bone TV show. Not because the trailers have made it look bad by any means, actually the trailers really drew me in, but because, like, if we're being honest, we've been burned by YA adaptations before. I hadn't even finished the TV show and already I'd ordered like Six of Crows, Crooked Kingdom I've now read, uh, I'm on to King of Scars, and I wanted to talk about it in a video, particularly how I think that the way that they have adapted this particular book and book series to screen works so well. If you aren't familiar with the books, the Shadow and Bone TV show follows the plot of the first episode of the Shadow and Bone trilogy, and then it also includes characters from the Six of Crows duology, although it's set kind of before the Six of Crows duology books are set. Which leads me very neatly onto my first point, which I think is one of the core reasons why this adaptation works so well, and that is the combining of these two separate book series that have just a few characters that kind of cross over um, and kind of are set within the same world and universe a few years apart but like functionally are two separate stories having them both combined to make this show. So when we're talking about adaptations in general and like what makes a good adaptation it's difficult because there are so many different kinds. So we have adaptations of classic texts. So our Shakespeare's, our Austin's, our Bronte's, um, that can sometimes be like modernized, they can be changed up. They're so well known that even people who haven't read them are still very familiar with the story. Like you don't have to have read Romeo and Juliet the play or even have seen it to like know what happens, to know that ending. And it's kind of accepted that you can totally mess with those stories and create something really great at the end of it. You can modernise it, you can make it into a teen movie, you can add zombies, and people are not really going to mind too much. I think in part because they know that that isn't going to be the only adaptation of that text. And then you have the adaptations where people are like, wait, that's a book? I feel like Jurassic Park is probably one of those that sometimes it doesn't even bear like a passing resemblance to the book it's based on, um, and people are much, much more familiar with the film than they are the adaptation. It's more known as like a good film rather than a good film adaptation. But then you have the kind of adaptation that Shadow and Bone is, which is adapting a story which already has a strong fan base. And I think this is one of those like high risk, high reward kind of decisions to make because you have a built in audience, you have people who are already really excited for the characters and to see the story come to life. So they will support it if it's good, but they also will absolutely not support it if it isn't. I think that we've seen this often when we look at these like really massive, especially like YA and teen titles, like Aragon, like Percy Jackson, where if it isn't a good adaptation, they're not going to see it just because it was made. I think that when you have a strong following for a book, you need to really understand why that following is so interested in it. What are the elements of the story that really resonate? What are the key scenes that if they are not portrayed on screen, will feel like the filmmakers just don't get it? I think it's really telling that a lot of the book fans who are talking about the Shadow and Bone cast are not really discussing like how much they might sound like or look like their characters or the script or anything like that, but looking at interviews with the cast and talking about and praising how much they understand their characters, how much they really get what it is that the fans see in those characters too. An adaptation doesn't have to be like 100% accurate or literal, like it wouldn't work if it was just every single scene as written in that order. That's kind of not really what we want to see, but it needs to understand like what the appeal is for the target audience. This was a show that clearly had support behind it, but it's not like it's one of those massive juggernauts like Marvel where you could guarantee like, oh yeah, we can do this TV show over here of these particular characters. And we know that like a couple of seasons in we'll also be able to launch this spin-off series. They wouldn't have been able to do that. So the decision would have been like, do we adapt Shadow and Bone or do we adapt Six of Crows if they hadn't combined them? And I think that it would have really missed a trick because there are there are people who are particularly fans of one or other of those book series. By combining them together, it allows us to have two different types of story, which I think is really valuable. There's been um, a couple of shows that have done this already. So I know The Expanse, I really, really love the way in which they combined, you know, like a film noir detective story with political intrigue, with this scrappy band of, you know, heroes in a spaceship drawn into an adventure that's too big for them. And that was, again, based on a book series, but that book series already had done the work to combine those things. I think it's really interesting and innovative what has been done with this show, where they've taken things and combined them within the show itself in a really novel way. So Six of Crows is set two years, I think, after the end of the Shadow and Bone trilogy, um, but rather than just taking the exact storyline that happens in Six of Crows and moving it earlier, we're looking at a prequel to the story of Six and Crows and the heist that that 
particular book series is about. Um, what that gives us is the ability to see these characters before the characters that we know from the books, right? They're younger, we, they haven't quite got to the point at which they are in the books. In fact, some of the characters from Six of Crows don't actually know each other yet in the show. We get to see them meeting for the first time. So it allows us to have this one story of Alina and the kind of shadow and bone side of things, which is YA, you know, chosen one, magical, uh, fantasy, love triangle stuff, which, if we're going to be brutally honest, feels dated in 2021 to me. It very much is a very particular, like, time within YA that I think has maybe happened and hasn't necessarily come back within the trend cycle yet. And then we have the Six of Crows characters, very different ensemble, uh, morally grey characters, planning a heist. Both of them have very clear structures and story arcs, but I think the combination of them together especially because the storylines are not just running parallel to each other and being completely unrelated, but are very much linked together, kind of adds to the complexity of both. And then we have this third storyline, which is following Nina and Matthias and their kind of developing relationship. I think the fact that they've definitely positioned the Six of Crows characters as being in like a prequel to the story that we know from the books was really smart, especially in the way that they leave room for character development. So the Kaz within this TV show is not necessarily the Kaz bracket that we see in the books. I think in the books he's much more ruthless, he's much more smart, like he is pretty much never taken by surprise, he always has a secondary plan, and we don't see him be at that point within his like development as a criminal mastermind uh, within the books. In the show he does make mistakes, his plan doesn't necessarily all go right, like he's still very ruthless and he's still someone that you, you know can hold his own but we're giving him some space to develop into that character that we know from Six of Crows which I think was smart because otherwise we would pretty much have a very similar outcome between these two stories if we get a season two with the Six of Crows heist we don't want it to just be a repetition of the previous season, we don't want the characters just to be stagnant, so I think that was a really smart choice. Similarly, the show gives us the first time Inej kills anyone, and the fact that she does it to protect Kaz, which I think is really interesting because in the books she already has killed, that's not something that is like new to her, and I think portraying some of those moments that are catalysts to cause like fundamental change within characters can be really satisfying, especially if they get brought up later and addressed, which it looks like it will be within the show. It feels like they're definitely aware of the fact that they are creating these like watershed moments for their characters. So this leads very nicely into the second kind of topic that I want to talk about, which is The Crows. It's 2am, I've finished the um, Six of Crows books and uh, just had a little cry and I just want everyone to know that I, just, I love those scrappy little teenagers so much. This first section is going to be about the foreshadowing that they put within the show for the events of Six of Crows, so I'm going to put timestamps below if you want to skip over and not get any spoilers. I think that they did this fantastically well. It was very satisfying as someone who at that point hadn't read the books to be watching the show, like I understood everything, I got who these characters were, it was all very very clear to me. But then once I'd read the books, so many elements of the show really jumped out as really exciting kind of foreshadowing. It felt like easter eggs for the book readers that didn't detract from uh, the show for people who weren't familiar with the books, it didn't feel confusing or like you were you were missing out on something if you hadn't read them, but it was really satisfying when you had. Um, so the the Wyland mention was great, Jasper talking about the fact that he wanted a demo guy, that was very clearly a little nod to uh, Wyland, a character who's going to be appearing in Six of Crows and will eventually be Jasper's love interest. We also see some great foreshadowing for the backstories of characters, so the Pekka Rollins and Kaz kind of confrontation scene within the show has Kaz asked Pekka, have we made a deal before? And because it's like, no, basically not that I can remember. That in the show, if you haven't read the books, is just kind of an interesting scene, you move on, but when you do know that Pekka and um, Kaz have such a interlinked and awful tragic backstory, that is a really great way of starting to drop hints and foreshadow for a backstory without kind of having to shoehorn in everyone's backstories into this first season. Um, and I really appreciated that because I think it's that slow burn of reveal that makes the books so good to me, that like restraint that Lee and Bodigo had when writing, uh, and so it kind of is giving giving the impression that that is going to be handled in a similar kind of uh, gently revealing way uh, within the show if they get more seasons. And then the third little crow foreshadowing that I wanted to mention is the foreshadowing of Jesper's Grisha powers. So we had just I think I caught two different throwaway uh, lines that really seem like they were hinting to me. One is when he's in a fight with the Grisha and uh, has the Grisha on the ground and the Grisha looks up and basically says, 
he starts to say, I think, like, you're a Grisha, but before he can, Jesper knocks him out and does, like, a little one-line quip, but it also could be read as him essentially, like, silencing this guy before he can say out loud this secret that Jesper has. Um, and the other one is a really, really casual throwaway line that Nej says to Kaz, like, oh, Jesper fixed your cane. Obviously, that might have been just because Jesper was very handy with some tools, but when you've read the books, you know that that probably was uh, more of a magical fixing than anything else. I think ultimately this foreshadowing was just a really, really great technique to ensure that it felt that there was a connection between these characters that we're seeing on screen and the characters that we know them to be from the books. The second thing I wanted to talk about in regards to the crow specifically is the fact that novels are very interior. You are hearing directly what a character is thinking and feeling, and so you under you kind of have this understanding of like psychologically what's going on and I think that sometimes adaptations can fall down when you have characters and this is why I picked it out specifically to do with the crows because obviously this could apply to any character in in any of the novels but with characters like Kaz they aren't necessarily going to be like talking about their feelings very openly that's actually kind of a marker of their characters so it can be quite difficult when you are trying to write a, a screenplay to be like, well, how do we get across what they're actually feeling when we can't have this internal monologue that we get within their chapters in the books? And I think that almost always a, a script, you know, is great, but it can only do so much. I think the actors are the ones who end up putting that together. And part of the reason why I think this show works is the acting is phenomenal across the whole cast, um, but especially within those characters where you don't necessarily get them saying what they mean or outwardly expressing their emotions um even if they aren't saying it you know they're not really projecting what they're really thinking uh, and so i think that that was just beautifully done i think sometimes within scripts when you start looking for it you see the tendency to want to like over explain to an audience or like overly signpost them um but i really enjoyed some of the restraint that they took in the show so for example we can see that Kaz has an issue with touch, right? Like we have things like him taking his gloves off but we never see his hands while he's washing his hands. Um, the fact that Inej is like injured and he can't bring himself to like hold her up and to touch her and Jesper has to do it. The fact that when they're all lying down next to each other, he is like moving his shoulder so that he isn't touching an edge. Like there's lots of these moments in which we understand that he doesn't like touching people, but they don't have like a really big scene where someone like introduces him by being like, this is Kaz, he never touches anyone. Or had a moment where he does something super out of character and starts talking about the fact that he doesn't like touching people. Like we're just allowed to see it within the performance. I think that kind of decision shows a lot of respect for the audience and what the audience can and will pick up on without you having to like really obviously kind of awkwardly signpost stuff like that. So third section, we are gonna be talking about something that I hinted at earlier but essentially it is Alina's storyline and just the concept of like the YA chosen one and how it could have gone very wrong but they course corrected and it went very right. So first of all let's talk about the love triangle element. So this, the love triangle I think is the bane of a lot of YA readers existence. Um, it's just something that comes up all the time especially with like YA female protagonists and especially within these kind of genre settings like dystopia or fantasy or sci-fi um, and I think a lot of people find them slightly tedious. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why they don't work is not inherently that, you know, there can't be an interesting story about someone who has attraction from, for more than one person or isn't sure who they want to date or isn't sure who's right for them. But the fact that oftentimes it is linked in with some quite, uh, annoying <laughs> tropes. Uh, one of these being the idea of like, jealousy and manipulation from like, both of the love interests. The idea that like extreme jealousy or annoyance is like a sign of someone really caring about you or, you know, it's it's that kind of stuff that I think very much should stay within like 2012 YA. This is something that's been like especially criticized by readers of the Shadow and Bone books in regards to the character of Mal, that there is a lot of kind of possessiveness and jealousy within his character that then tastes a little bit bitter when we're meant to like like him and Alina together. Whereas in the show, they have definitely been taking steps to show us that that isn't the case with this particular version of Mal that they're creating. So for example, in the show, there is a scene in which she calls the Darkling by his first name and Mal's like, oh, wait, who's that? And she realizes that she's going to have to tell him like, I got really close to this guy some stuff happened. She says, you know, I made some mistakes while I was in the Little Palace. And rather than have Mal react in a possessive way or an angry way or anything like that, there is this understanding of like, yep, we're friends and maybe there is something between us that we've never spoken about. But like, 
I don't own you. I don't, you didn't cheat on me. Like there's, there's nothing for me to be annoyed about. Like, that's fine. And I think that that was a really, really refreshing thing to see and, and made me and a lot of other people much more excited about a potential Mal and Alina relationship because it felt like there was genuine respect between the two of them. I think also in the book, even though the book is more from Alina's point of view and so we can see that there might be a bit of an unreliable narrator element, but there is this idea from her that like, she, it's a one-sided crush that she has on Mal at first, that it's much more her being in love with him and not necessarily reciprocal. Whereas again, within the show, we kind of see this very similar level of affection growing between the two of them simultaneously. And that it's more a case of them trying to figure out or needing to figure out like what exactly it is that's going on between them together rather than it being kind of a one-sided awkward thing. Which then kind of links into another classic kind of element of the YA chosen one trope, which is a real lack of agency from these characters. I think for a couple of reasons, right? So um, one is that it allows the characters to become a kind of like audience stand-in. That If these characters have a lot of stuff like just happening to them, that it's easier for a reader to kind of insert themselves into that role. And there are elements within those Shadow and Bone books of Alina like having agency and taking control, but I definitely think within the show they have upped that much more. So for example, in the show it is Alina who goes to Kirigan and approaches him and kisses him first, as opposed to the books where he kisses her. Both in the show and the book, the scar on her hand has a kind of symbolic connection to the relationship between her and Mal, but in very different ways that I think totally changes the amount of agency that she has over her own story. So in the books, Mal goes away on a hunting trip and she goes to like hug him when he comes back and is really overwhelmed by these like feelings of love that she has for him that she totally forgets there's like a piece of pottery in her hand. And so it's very much like this accidental thing just linked to this kind of like crush that she has on him. Whereas in the show, she deliberately gives herself the cut because when people come to investigate and see which children have Grisha powers, she doesn't want to be taken away from him. She doesn't know if she has the powers or not, but she knows that by inflicting this wound and causing herself pain, she can kind of override and cheat the test. And it's a way for her to kind of have agency over her future and know that she wants to stay with her friend and that she doesn't want to be separated and for them both not to be alone. It's a lot of stuff that gets changed in the show where it doesn't necessarily change big parts of the story or how it goes. It's more that they give the decisions to Alina rather than to these other characters, that she's the one that decides to go after the stag rather than Mal. Like, there are all of these things where, where she is given the agency and that choice, and I feel like that tells us a lot more about her character, even as she's someone who's being swept up into a world that she isn't very unfamiliar with, and it would have been very easy for her to just have been a character that stuff happens to. So at this point, we need to talk a little bit about an element of Alina's storyline that has been changed from the books that has come under some criticism, which is the change from her being a kind of assumed white character to being half Shu. So Shu Han is a country that is in conflict with Ravka, which is, you know, the country that Alina actually lives in, and so that creates a lot of tension with other people within the country who is used to considering people that look like her to be their enemies. Um, the country within the books was based on kind of both Chinese and Mongolian cultures. So it's very obviously a stand-in for like an Asian country in a similar way to the way that Ravka is a stand-in for uh, Russia. In the show they portray her half-shoe heritage as a source of like real like racist hatred and vitriol towards her from like when she's a child all the way up to like the events in the Little Palace. There are other characters of colour like within this cast but none of them seem to have the same kind of reaction against them as Alina has. Although there are portrayals of some like racist microaggressions and also like a lot of exoticism that are levelled against these characters. It kind of feels like there's something much more intense about the way in which Alina is treated. So as someone who is white and hasn't experienced this racism, I'm not gonna give you like <laughs> Rowan's hot takes on this, um, but I have been reading and kind of watching people's videos and stuff like that uh, around this topic who do have experience of this, who are like mixed race or um, East Asian themselves. And there are a lot of different opinions out there. And so I wanted to kind of like share with you some interesting points that I've seen other people make. Um, but if this is something that's of interest to you, definitely go out and like read stuff by those people and, and watch their videos and check out their TikTok and all that kind of stuff because it's a really interesting discussion that I think we're going to be having more often as films and TV shows start to introduce more diversity within characters where they change a character's background and 
we kind of need to talk about like what are the implications of that what does that add or take away from the original um is there a way of doing that well are there pitfalls where people might be doing it badly so some people have talked about the idea that like fantasy is meant to be escapism it's meant to be something that takes you away from the world that you're living in and to suddenly be confronted with this kind of racism especially when it wasn't in the books and especially when it lands so close to the way that like actual Asian people are treated in the real world like it's not just a kind of stand-in for racism like it's using insults that are actually leveled against people right now in reality that felt like very jarring to a lot of people who were watching. There were also people who questioned why there was only kind of serious overt racism going on with Alina's storyline and not any of the other characters of colour and to them it kind of felt a little bit half-baked like they decided that this was going to be something interesting they could you know add in to Alina's character but hadn't really thought through in terms of the overall world building. Other people on the other hand were very excited to have representation especially of like a mixed race character with this particular kind of heritage that felt like something that was quite novel and new and exciting um, and something that definitely should be happening more often. There's also this idea that it sort of adds to the existing story of Alina feeling like an outsider, but giving more of a justification for it, and also go some way to supporting reasons why Alina would feel more drawn towards Kirigan as someone who also experiences life as an outsider in some way, and also never treats her badly because of her heritage. And then there's also people kind of giving some possible in-world explanations for why Alina has been treated that way in particular. The idea that, you know, Ravka is specifically in conflict with Shuhan, and although there are other nations they are in conflict with, those are all um, her populations that are very like white European coded. And so this very visual difference where people can like immediately see that you are kind of what they associate as the enemy might be an explanation for this. Kind of the idea that it isn't necessarily an indication of like a general idea of racism, but like very specifically a prejudice based on this conflict. So yeah, for some people that element of the story was something that took away from the story, for some people it was something that added to it. I think I'd be really interested to see with season two with the criticisms people have brought up and also the fact that we are going to be getting some more Shu characters within the next season if it follows the books. Um, it will be interesting to see where they take that and if they develop it or how they kind of deal with those criticisms in the future. Okay, and this so next short section I want to talk about like things that they added that I think really worked. So it was such a like limited series, it felt very kind of compact, but not in a way for me that really felt ever rushed. It, it felt like they had included exactly the right amount to flesh out the story, to make it interesting, to keep it pacey, but not to kind of over bloat it. And so even though they did add some stuff, it didn't feel like it was just adding story for the sake of it, it was all stuff that to me really was enhancing what they were trying to do with that main storyline from the books. So obviously within the books, especially The Shadow and Bone, which are told in the first person, we only can get Alina's point of view, right? And so there are some things that happen in the books, like Mal going after the stag, that he just tells her about afterwards, but we actually get to see it on the show, and I think stuff like that is really important and a lot more dynamic than just having characters, you know, talk through what they've already done. I think adding the Arkan smuggler character and storyline was super interesting, it was a great bit of world building, and it also allowed people who had already read the books to have an element of the story that felt surprising. This is a new character, we don't know what his allegiances are, we don't know what he's like, uh, and so that felt really interesting, like a really good choice to me. Similarly, the inclusion of like General Zlatan and the kind of Civil War storyline and his impetus was really interesting and exciting. I think when you're writing a book and you have a first person storyline, it makes sense to be very focused because you're, if your character is not going to be interested in a particular political situation or an economic issue, why would they tell the reader about it, right? It has to be from their point of view. And so as soon as you pull out of just Selena's point of view, there are so many things that are going on within the wider world building that's suddenly irrelevant and can add to the tension, and this felt like one of them. With the Darkling's backstory, there is an element of making him seem more sympathetic within the show in terms of his backstory being something which didn't feel like a deliberate thing. It wasn't something that he was actively trying to do. It seemed a lot more like it was a moment of like grief and suffering and like anger within him that made this fold. But at the same time, they never seem to want to excuse what he's doing or his kind of control that he's trying to have, the methods that he's going about it, like those are all things that are still condemned. And I, I like the idea that you can have a, a villain who has a storyline, like in a backstory that you can say, oh, I can kind of see how this isn't necessarily all entirely your fault. But then also he's not a good guy. He doesn't get that redemption arc right now. Like we, we still understand that he's uh, doing awful things, which brings me onto my final kind of like addition that I think completely solidifies this. 
which is the necklace, it's the antler necklace. So in the books, it's kind of described and a lot of people kind of imagined it and saw it much more like a kind of traditional like necklace collar that's placed on. It's kind of made unbreakable by Grisha powers, but it's it's not what it was on the show, which is this visceral body horror of having something sunken into your body and protruding out. It's something that doesn't feel, even though it's meant to amplify powers, it doesn't make someone feel powerful. It makes you feel like violated. And I feel like we really felt that, especially with the acting of Jessie Mae Lee, like the moment where she's, you see her touching the antlers and she almost like can't bring herself to look down and see that like violation that she was portraying was just brilliant. And I think really took the idea of what it means to be like, someone's tool, someone's possession within their plans and that hopelessness, it really took it to a visual, visual kind of visceral level and I thought it was beautifully done. And the final thing I want to talk about is something that I actually um, maybe is too hot of a take. Uh, I feel like this is going to have a lot of people disagreeing with me and being very annoyed at me, but it's something that I felt like worked a lot better in the books than it did in the show and that is basically the whole of the Nina and Matthias storyline. So not wanting to give uh, too much away or do spoilers for Six of Crows, at the beginning of Six of Crows, like everything that's happening on the show right now with Nina and Matthias is their backstory in the books, right? Like it's it's happened to them already. And so we reach them in the books at a point where all of this stuff has already happened. And Matthias has a reason to hate Nina that isn't the fact she's a Grisha. There is other stuff that's going on that means that he's justified in being annoyed or being angry with her. And so in the books, the journey is like them reconciling and then we get flashbacks to what happened. And I will say even in the books, I was kind of hesitant around this idea of like a romance forming between someone who has a history of like being in what's functionally a hate group against Grishas, then forming a romantic relationship with someone who is a Grisha. And I think that the issue I had within the series is that they try to make his like romantic relationship with Nina and him like getting to just the very start of like contemplating the fact that like maybe this like racist <laughs> you know culture I've been raised in and this like cult that I've been raised in is not right that stuff was happening like simultaneously, which did make it feel like the only reason why he was questioning any of this was because he like had a thing for a Grisha who canonically he views as like not even less than human, but like less than an animal. And the book kind of saves itself by having some stuff from his point of view. And so you understand that he is like constantly psychologically, like internally making the decision to try and unlearn what he has been told and like how he's been brainwashed and that it is something that he knows he's gonna have to work at and it felt like something that was much more of a not like a here is your redemption arc and the prize at the end is a girlfriend but like it was something that he was genuinely battling with but I think on the show that same issue that I talked about before that they kind of managed to get through with Kaz and Inesh's characters like the idea of you know characters who are quite withdrawn and aren't going to be emotionally super available it didn't quite work for me with Matthias. I felt like he, by doing what I think is like one of my least favorite tropes of romance in general, and it happens all the time with straight characters, which is like, we hate each other, so we must fancy each other. Like, oh, if a boy pulls your pigtails and pushes you down in the playground, he really loves you. I'm, I'm really like, I find that kind of a bit of a gross trope anyway. And for this, it was like so extreme. Um, like he functionally kidnaps her. Um, it's like holding her for a trial in which she will be like found guilty and killed um and calls her slurs and just in general it's like it's very extreme and I don't think that the series was long enough to feel like he had gotten enough through his arc independently of like unlearning to then start feeling something for her it all to me felt way too tied together like don't get me wrong like I am very interested in stories around people who are like raised in environments in which they have been taught to think a certain way and then do the work to to change themselves and change the outlook and try and challenge that way that they have been taught and break away from it to become a better person. Like, I love the idea of that storyline. I just think that if it's tied in with a romance as like, as if kind of like the reward for getting over your hatred of these people is like getting to 
be with one of them that you fancy feels, yeah, it just feels weird to me. I kind of feel bad about the fact that my last big section of this was about more of a reservation I have about the show because in general I did really really like it but I wanted to be honest and kind of give a rounded view of how I kind of saw it. Um, I think that this, one of the strongest things about the show is its cast. Um, obviously it's like the production design is beautiful, the writing is superb, but the cast really have brought it to life for me um, and I'm very excited to see other stuff that they do. I know a lot of them are kind of newcomers or have mainly done theatre and I'm very excited to see what other series that they're in um, or other films in the future. As of filming this, there is not confirmation of a season two, but I really hope it happens mainly just because now I'm like such a massive fan of the Six of Crows duology that I need to see, <laughs> I need to see those books on screen. So as I mentioned this is kind of different to my normal videos, typically they're more long form, like scripted video essay type stuff, um, but if you liked this kind of thing, like something more off the cuff, chatting through notes uh, about, you know, something that's just happened, something that's a lot more kind of of the moment, uh, let me know because maybe I could do some more of these in between my usual long videos every month. And as always, if you'd like to help support me make videos in general, then I will leave a link to my Patreon below, along with my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye. Yeah? Two foxes in the garden. Okay, I'm filming, so I, I unfortunately cannot come and see the foxes, but thank you for the update. <laughs>